Okay, we might we might begin now. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this afternoon's lecture series, running as part of the AHRC funded project Grief, a study of human emotional experience at the University of York. My name is Emily Hughes, and I'm one of the postdoctoral research associates working on the project project alongside Matthew Ratcliffe, Louise Richardson, Becky Miller and Eleanor Byrne. The overarching aim of this four-year project is to develop a detailed, wide-ranging and integrated account of what it is to experience grief, focusing on aspects of grief that are of considerable theoretical and practical importance, but remain poorly understood. Today, we're extremely pleased to welcome Dr. Edith Maria Stephan to give a lecture on continuing bonds in bereavement, insights from research and grief therapy practice. Dr. Stephan is a senior lecturer in counselling psychology at the University of Roehampton and an HCPC registered counselling psychologist in private practice. Her research focuses on continuing bonds in bereavement, on sensory and quasi-sensory experiences of the deceased and on meaning-oriented grief therapy. She's published her research in a wide range of journals. In 2018, she was co-editor of Continuing Bonds in Bereavement, New Directions for Research and Practice. Her current projects include a survey of continuing bonds, the handbook of grief therapies for SAGE and working with continuing bonds in grief therapy for Routledge. This afternoon's lecture will run for approximately one hour with half an hour afterwards for questions. At the conclusion of the talk, my colleague Becky Miller will field the questions. Please, do, please note that Dr. Stephan's talk will be recorded, but the recording will stop before question time. With that, I would like to warmly welcome Dr. Stephan to speak with us. Great, thank you, Emily. I'm going to just share my screen before I start. Right. Okay, so hello everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak today and thank you everyone for coming in your busy days. And um, it's really great to see you all. Um, so I'm going to talk about continuing bonds in bereavement. I'm going to first talk a bit about the perspective um, of continuing bonds and its origins. And then I'm going to talk about some research in continuing bonds, especially some that's currently ongoing. And, and then I will uh, focus on working with continuing bonds in grief therapy and counseling and talk about some of techniques that uh, are used there or can be used. And some of these are specific to a grief therapy context, but some of these can also be translated into um, any kind of support um, context. So if you're running support groups, for example, um, there are some techniques here that can be easily translated and don't require sort of a therapeutic context, but some do require a more therapeutic context. But I will point that out when I go through those techniques. Um, so, but before I start, so or, well, this is the start. I want to ask some ask ourselves some questions. Okay. What is our understanding of the person? How do we see ourselves as people? Sorry, I've got a problem here. Okay. Is it like this, a separate bounded individual? Is that how we see the self, separate? Or is it more like this? So, so this is Bron from Brenner's model, uh, uh, ecological model of the person. And here we see the individual as embedded in um, these wider systems of family, community, wider culture, sociopolitical frames, and that the person is sort of part of that and that these spheres are also part of the person rather than being a bounded, separate individual. How do we view our relationships with previous generations? Like this? Or more like this? So here you see um, a, a, an expression of how 
connectedness, a, a, a loving and honoring relationship between different generations can um, provide this kind of almost warming sense of presence in the lives of the, of the living. This is an expression or a, a sense that has not always been welcomed or embraced in Western psychological approaches to bereavement. In fact, what we've seen, especially in the 20th century, is a tendency to the opposite, to break those relationships with the deceased. And this has often been called the breaking bonds paradigm, which really needs to be, the continuing bonds paradigm needs to be seen as growing out of this opposition to this paradigm. So this was really the, a 20th century Western view, often for its paper, Morning Melancholia, is quoted there as a, an origin of this, but surely it's probably its most famous expression, but not its only of, of, of first one, where um, disengagement from the deceased was seen as necessary, that, and that was a painful process so that you're free to engage in new relationships, this letting go and moving on. And that was seen as the necessity to adjust to the loss, very different to maybe 19th century Victorianism, where um, you know, more, a mourning culture was much more acceptable. Um, internalization of the deceased was seen as a pathology, unless it's a sort of transitional way of disengaging from the deceased. And this ongoing connection was often called unresolved loss or a sign of complicated grief. So against this, the continuing bonds model developed in a way there was a dissatisfaction with this kind of model that pathologizes the ongoing relationships with the deceased. Dennis Klaas, who I believe we'll be talking in two weeks time here, he did a, a long ethnographic study of bereaved parents and found that they were all developing and, and continuing their relationships with the deceased. Similarly, Phyllis Silverman conducted a study of how bereaved children were constructing their deceased parents as ongoing presences in their lives. There were also insights from developmental psychology about bonding as a mutual um, process. And there were insights particularly from different cultures. So for example, Japanese ancestor worship and um, it, there was this sort of opening up to other cultures at, in the, towards the end of the 20th century and in bereavement studies to think, hang on, you know, it's, it's okay in Japan, but it's not okay here. What's going on there? And at the same time, there were other people who were sort of going into that direction, like Simon Shimshon Rubin with his two-track model of bereavement, because he was already sort of integrating that relationship with the deceased in, into the work. And also the sociologist Tony Walter developed his idea of the durable biography of the dead, that we construct that biography of the dead after their death, that they continue to actually be written, that they, these biographies by the um, living. So there were similar ideas going on, and they led then to this um, explosion, I would say, of the continuing bonds revolution. And this was really the seminal publication in 1996 by Klaas Silverman and Nickman that changed so much. Um, it cannot be underestimated how much this publication actually um, triggered off uh, because it spoke to people. It spoke to people on the ground who had already felt dissatisfied with this idea of letting go and moving on when they were working with bereaved people. And so this book actually framed it and put it all out there and really challenged um, the uh, dominant model. Um, and that really signaled a paradigm shift, both in research and practice uh, for the past 25 years. And in that book, um, they, they described, they actually looked at it differently. They actually looked at this dominant model uh, from a different perspective. So sometimes in Western psychology, um, one view of reality, the dominant scientific model is, is, is sort of almost arrogantly seen as, as the one way of looking at things. But um, 
from a sort of more postmodern perspective, you can see this as also just a cultural construction. So they were saying this breaking bonds model is actually located in modernism. You know, it's not, this is not an objective truth that we need to let go of the disease. This is just what's current and or what has been current, which has to do with the, the general zeitgeist of reason, rationality, wanting progress, efficiency. In psychology, there was this machine met metaphor that hum of human functionality. And of course, then grief is just a debilitating emotional response, something troublesome that interferes with your functioning. Um, there, there's other things that came in that need to be taken into account, as Walter pointed out, that there were two world wars, which with so much grief, people cannot cope. So they have to survive and maybe pushing that aside and letting go and moving on is actually a survival mechanism. So we can actually also see these cultural tendencies in, 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 uh, from that perspective. And they were also critiquing this current model in terms of um, sort of forgetting that someone is dead isn't really the same as continuing a relationship with the deceased as an ongoing resource and spiritual presence. So what they were saying was we propose that it is normative for mourners to maintain a presence and connection with the deceased and that this presence is not static. And we propose rather than emphasizing letting go, the emphasis should be on negotiating, renegotiating the meaning of the loss over time. Um, and they're saying we're developing a model of grieving here that focuses on the complexity of human relationships and the ways in which people remain connected to each other in life and death. And this model is still being developed by different researchers, scholars, by different practitioners in different disciplines. Um, yeah, the, the book that uh, was uh, on the other slide from 2018 and um, that I was co a co-editor of that uh, brings together a lot of the more recent work in, in, across different disciplines on continuing bonds. So that model is being developed as we speak. But sort of what are the basic assumptions of the continuing bonds model as we know it now? Well, the first thing and the most important one, in my view, is that it is a sociocultural model. Um, these bonds are not the same as attachment relationships between separate individuals. So attachment theory, although it is also developing, um, is still very much based around people as separate and as um, uh, uh, the other person being a mental representation in the head of a separate individual. And continuing bonds are actually about, go, go a bit further than that. Um, we're seeing um, the person to be actually relational. The self is relational. Part of ourselves is bound up with those that are closely connected with. Connected with. These relationships stay part of us. This is not just between two people. There's a communal dimension to continuing bonds. Um, as we are experiencing our uh, uh, dead, our loved ones in groups and communities in societies. The other thing is that the continuing bonds are very much dynamic and fluid. It's not a relationship with a, with a frozen image of someone in my head, but there's a, there's a relationship that continues, that there's new information about the deceased or I'm changing myself so my relationship changes so these things develop and how we understand this is very much shaped by cultural narratives by belief systems religious belief systems and practices and yeah a multidisciplinary approach is uh, very much desired within this paradigm or perspective so how do continuing bonds expressions actually manifest so People do things like talking to the deceased, sharing stories about the deceased, leaving messages on social media. I see it more and more if I open Twitter. I, I usually daily see someone saying, happy birthday, um, my mother in heaven, or you know, people actually talk directly to the deceased through social media. Um, and it's become quite a, a, an acceptable practice now. 
people who have sense of presence experiences, maybe dreams, keeping significant mementos possessions of the deceased, engaging in rituals to honor or memorialize the deceased legacy project, shared meaning, symbols, metaphors. Uh, a lot of people talk about robins, um, for just as an example. And so the whole family thinks every time a robin lands, they, it seems like a symbol of the deceased being with them. So these are sort of examples that um, uh, people often give. So here's um, a little quote from a, a, an interview participant in my research. I don't feel I've completely lost her. I feel somewhere she's there. She's not changed at all. She's just the same person that she was. It's almost like she's there in the background, almost just making sure things are kind of okay. So for this participant, uh, what this her grandmother was in her life, this person who was looking after her, um, is, is still available as a presence. It's, um, it's not a, just a memory, it is actually an ongoing experience. So a lot of research has actually been done, sort of especially qualitative research. So um, there's um, the book, Continuing Bonds, New Understandings of Grief, actually has several papers um, in their qualitative research papers with interviews uh, and different method methods uh, of analysis um, have been used, Some really nice um, papers there. Sense of presence experiences have often been particularly researched as a sort of one aspect of continuing bonds. And there's quite a few papers on that. Um, different cultural contexts have also been tapped into, and there's more and more coming um, from, from different cultures now. Um, this is, these are just some examples. Um, I think I've sort of singled out a little bit the narrative discursive research because it opens up a completely different um, dimension. Um, it often involves a very finely grained analysis of how people talk about their deceased and uh, what you can actually sort of um, find what they're doing by, by through that. So Bennett and Bennett is a, is a wonderful example here. Of, um, of that. I could go into detail, but I won't because that we haven't got the time for that, but I can um, recommend um, some of these to you. And then there's also been ethnographic research uh, that's been done, observation, um, for example, families in families. Um, <clears throat> quantitative research has also been conducted into continuing bonds. And here, the idea of continuing bonds has been particularly picked up by attachment theorists who have sort of used the term continuing bonds almost interchangeably with attachment. Um, and you know that I take issue with that because I see this as somewhat different, but maybe, um, you know, something we could discuss. And um, what they've often been interested in is um, are these helpful or unhelpful, or what makes continuing bonds helpful or unhelpful in adjustment to loss? These studies are a bit problematic because there isn't really a good measure of continuing bonds. Continuing bonds, there, there's these internalized versus externalized continuing bonds expressions at the moment that's often used, but there's a lot, there are a lot of issues with that. The other problem is that how do we actually define what constitutes adjustment to loss? Another problem is that continuing bonds and grief distress are often correlated. So is con are continuing bonds causing this distress? Is the distress causing the continuing bonds? Or are they actually two sides of the same coin? Um, so there's some interesting research on that. And actually, um, to, um, if you are interested in the research side, I would recommend this review paper. Um, that they're looking, they've sort of looked at some of the research that's been done, both qualitative and quantitative. And they sort of said the de definitions need to actually be refined. We need to be clearer about dimensions of these continuing bonds expressions. We need to have more research into frequency, subjective experience, valence, meaning of different expressions. Um, they also said, uh, gave the recommendation to study the impact of the quality of the pre-death relationship with the deceased or the role of afterlife beliefs. 
So, um, and, and culture as well, which I haven't included on this slide. Um, so my, per personally, my research has been particularly about one experience, one type of continuing bonds expression, which is the uh, sense of presence, or as we now call them, sensory and quasi-sensory experiences of the deceased, or as we currently call them, the names keep changing. And there's a whole range of different names that have been given to these experiences um, in, in, in different parts of the literature. So here's an example of one. I felt there was somebody in the room. I knew it was her. I knew it was her. It was almost like she was just almost hovering over me. Well, right above me. I was lying in bed and it was almost like she was just there. I couldn't see her, but I could feel the sensation on my hair, which was something she used to do, stroking my hair. It was a nice feeling and I didn't feel frightened by it at all. It was just, it was very comforting. So this is quite a sort of typical experience as people describe. I mean, people experience the disease in all sorts of senses, or whether it's tactile voices, visions, everything. But, but just the way this is described in, in this sort of not quite, it's almost like she was there, but she is there. I feel her. <laughs> And, and this is this kind of ambivalence almost about what is there and what isn't there and what am I perceiving, what is, am I not perceiving, is really something we often um, find in the descriptions of these experiences of presence. Um, and um, yeah, Matthew has written a lot about that and um, uh, really fascinating um, uh, material. So, and I, I did an interview study um, on this 10 years ago, uh, was published uh, with 12 participants. I'm not going into details of that, but just wanted to show you that. And this is what we were recently involved in. And we've done, we've been in a working group on sensory and quasi-sensory experiences of the deceased and bereavement. So all the people at the top, in the top row, that each of, each of the, these people has done, did their doctoral research on these experiences alone so um, and uh, so it was amazing and to bring us together with neuroscientists um, philosopher Matthew Radcliffe and um, you know and have this kind of um, collaboration it was a very very um, stimulating experience and we we are still working together now which is amazing so we published this review paper if you're interested um, uh, an, an interdisciplinary and integrative review that is, I think, freely, openly available. I think it's got its open access. So now I want to talk a little bit about my work in progress, which is this continuing bond survey that uh, was mentioned. This is a survey of continuing bonds and bereavement with a focus on the pre-death relationship quality and closeness, as well as differences in individualism and collectivism. So this is a collaboration with Karina Kamp from Aarhus University in Denmark. And we have um, had a whole lot of items in this survey about the bereavement. We actually developed a, our own list of continuing bonds activities or expressions, 23 items with follow-up questions. Quality of the pre-death relationship. So some measures we put into this um, um, that we're interested in individualism and collectivism. But we also put in sort of typical grief, me the typical grief measure, prolonged grief, uh, PG-13, um, depression, loneliness, also post-traumatic growth. And then we had follow-up questions on the most significant continuing bonds expression, like positive or negative, comforting, distressing, meaningful, what functions do people see in it? Obviously, this is this feels so brash compared to the qualitative research I was talking about before, but that is really what you need to do. Of course, you need to be much more reductionist when you're doing quantitative research. Um, we had follow-up questions as well. 
including textual description of any sensory experiences and which senses, how vivid, real messages received. These questions were co closely aligned to Karina's questions from her own survey into um, Danish, a Danish population, so we can compare the results. Yeah. Um, so we collected data from actually 312 participants through Prolific. And we collected this between October 2019 and December 2019, it should say, not 2020, because it's a, actually a pre-pandemic sample that we've collected. When I was looking at who actually completed this questionnaire, I found that the uh, sample is unfortunately, again, weird, as they've called it, Western Educated Industrialized Rich and Democratic. So this is uh, something that you often see in the anthropological literature as a criticism of, of much um, uh, psychological research, which is often on those kinds of samples. And again, we are very similar in that here, that this is the sample we got, um, you know, predominantly white. And in terms of religion, either Christian or, usually, or not, usually not believing, but not a lot of other faiths, um, uh, represented. So what I've done is I wanted to show you as this is a sort of a preview, what people actually endorsed as continuing bonds that they're engaging in. Um, so and I've, I've kind of structured these around different overarching themes. And that's just what I did. And that could be changed. You know, you could structure them or, or organize them in a different way. This is, I just did it for this presentation now. Um, I've, I've organized them. So it's not just 23 different things, but you can see, see sort of generally what people were doing. So we looked at inner connection in a way, remembering, thinking, daydreaming. Um, what would the deceased do in a given situation, carrying out their wishes, looking at photos. I mean, talking or writing to the deceased could actually go somewhat in a different direction. It could go in a different category. So then continuing bonds through social connection, what people do there, talking about the deceased, sharing stories, connecting with people who knew the deceased, commemorating significant days, maybe doing something in the name of the deceased. Social media was actually uh, a low, to only up to 20% said they were doing this. I had expected more there. Then continuing bonds through physical connection and ritual. Um, so using possessions of the disease, keeping places the same, doing things the person used to do, eating their favorite food, spending time in places associated with them, maybe rituals, altar, shrine, lighting candles, keeping the ashes close by. So these are much more the sort of physical embodied space um, activities. And then I, for want of a better word, I call this spiritual connection, but yeah, it doesn't need to be a spiritual framing for the person. Um, sort of like very vivid real dreams or noticing synchronicities, signs and symbols, having sensory experiences, viewing the deceased as coming back in the form of another being, trying to contact the deceased with a medium or psychic through, through specific practices. So you can see with these percentages, how people, um, how the, they scored on that. And we also, another little preview is what people endorsed in terms of what this does for them, uh, what you get out of this. It helps me remember the deceased, it's for my own benefit, help me cope, helped me connect with the deceased, meant I could honor the deceased, it was for the benefit of others, helped me feel physically close, it meant the deceased was still around. So yeah, I'm not going through all of them. So these were things that actually, um, some of them came from Karina's survey, but we added to them. Um, and uh, they're just ideas, you know, we ask other as well, so people could add their own. So yeah, so this is um, what is uh, in progress. And what we're going to do is three studies um, 
first is what I mentioned already, this link between the perceived quality of the pre-death relationship and various continuing bonds expressions and how they are evaluated. So we think that this is quite, you know, like so much research, you'd think, do you really need to research to find this out? Because it seems so clear, higher level of closeness predicts a more positive evaluation of continuing bonds. Um, it seems to be quite um, obvious. So, but, but it's still useful to, to check this out and then also to do some more exploratory research uh, afterwards around these connections. And then the second study is on the, just on the sensory experiences and whether there are associations with bereavement-related distress, because this is sort of one of the, um, that's where Karina is heading, this is Karina heading up um, as an interest um, in this kind of connection, um, because the clinical literature is still very interested in, um, is this pathological or not? So we'll see what our survey contributes to that. And then the third one um, is, this is sort of my pet one, which is the impact of a collectivist or individualist orientation on continuing bonds. So I'm, I'm imagining, um, thinking that collective, a collectivist perspective is going to be associated maybe with a, with a more um, positive or meaningful experience of continuing bonds. Uh, but we don't know that. So this is at the moment just a, a thought. So that's what we're doing. And um, just to sort of go back to this cultural aspect of it, um, as uh, has been uh, shown, and Pablo Sabuquedo, one of our group, has uh, looked particularly at cultural aspects of um, these experiences and how they are anticipated, experienced and evaluated, the sense of presence experiences in particular, is influenced by sociocultural processes. So um, the cu cultural aspects of this is particularly important to do more research in. And so this is our new project or one that we're hoping to do, which is a cross-cultural qualitative study of these experiences. and. Um, so we're hoping that we can interview um, perceivers at five different sites in Europe, Asia and Africa. We've already got all, a team of researchers together who are multicultural and multidisciplinary. They each interview in their own language. And we then want to do narrative analysis of, these, uh, of the data and find out some sort of pathways to meaning making. We don't want to just sort of say, oh, in this culture, it's like this, and in this culture, it's like that, because you can't directly compare that with, with small samples, um, and you don't know whether the differences between the samples are only about um, being in a different context. There could be other things going on, but what we can find is maybe tendencies, or we can um, uh, draw new hypotheses from, from this research, and we can also... Um, find what I was saying, sort of these pathways to meaning making of these experiences. So, but this is particularly about the sensory experiences of the deceased, which is only one small or yeah, big, whichever you want to say, one aspect of continuing bonds. As, I said, as you saw in our sample of this survey, it was 43% who said they had this, had had this. Okay, so now I'd like to move to the second part of this talk, which is really about more continuing bonds and how to work with them in grief therapy and counseling. So you might think, well, if these are usually natural, normal experiences, and it's actually stig social stigma, that's the problem, or why would we want to or need to even work with them in grief therapy and counseling? So, I mean, one way of looking at it is that, um, you know, uh, continuing bonds can be very helpful to people and maybe people would like to have more, um, would like to have that benefit. And so sometimes they may not get that benefit. So there's something that's hampering this process potentially. So for example, when the dominant culture dismisses or discourages continuing bonds, 
So that stigma is, it can actually be something we can work with in a therapeutic context. context. Um, lack of conceptual frameworks. So person, the person may not know how to express it. It's often very difficult to talk about presence or an ongoing relationship with someone who's died. Uh, how is that looked at? So it's, there's, there is the, 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 we don't have language but, or, or symbols perhaps for that. So therapy can help people find an expression for this. Disenfranchised grief. Um, so that is when um, uh, your mourning isn't accepted, that you're not um, a, 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 an accepted, acceptable mourner. Uh, it could either be because your relationship with the deceased is um, secret or, or not recognized, or it could be that um, the person uh, died of a death that is uh, stigmatized, like sometimes uh, you hear about drug-related death and people's experiences as, as um, not having the right to mourn. <clears throat> so that can also lead to an isolation in your bond experience, a lack of support. As we said, it is this, we see this continuing bonds idea as something sociocultural, not just something you do on your own necessarily in your, in, in your own room, although this is what often happens, but that can also be a problem. <clears throat> There may be difficulties in the relationship with the deceased. We talked about the quality of the relationship with the deceased as possibly very important. Um, often this is discussed as unfinished business. Um, there's unfinished business in the relationship which needs to be resolved. Um, Lorraine Hedke and John Winslade actually called it ongoing business in the relationship, which I really like. So, Difficulty accessing memories could be something that someone brings into the, into the therapy room. So one of my supervisees looked at suicide, bereavement and continuing bonds in um, childhood. So when your parent died of suicide very early on and then nobody talks about it, it's, it's kind of silenced. And, and she described how people were trying to construct this deceased somehow without having a lot to go on. So that could be something, or for example, when um, uh, sometimes perinatal deaths are very similar where there's not much to go on to actually want to have that continuing bond, however, and that's where therapy can also be really useful. Dissociation as part of traumatic grief can prevent access. Now this sounds like a big deal, a big pathological thing, but actually I find this may be present in almost every bereavement because there's always, a, or there tends to always be something around that actual dying that remains prominent in your mind. Maybe images of the deceased suffering before they died. And um, all these things that happened around the death, they can often be uh, preventing access to the person they were in life. And people get very distressed sometimes about that, that they can't access those memories. So that could also, that usually um, in that case, you would actually work more with the trauma first and with the, with the experiences around the, um, uh, around the dying. But that is also something that can then give way when you've dealt with that to um, a new relationship with the deceased. And of course, feelings of anguish, guilt, shame, anger, you know, all these emotions can also um, be coming in and getting in the way. Uh, also fear of losing the connection. So someone may be so scared that they lose that, that they become very fixated on a specific thing. And, you know, as we were saying before, um, these relationships are fluid. So that means sometimes the disease may be more present and sometimes less present, or sometimes you feel them, you know, you, so, so there's a sort of a... Um, a flexibility there that sometimes is very difficult when you're really anxious about losing the connection. So you're holding on to something and, and then without wanting to, you're actually making it harder to have that uh, continuing relationship. And then of course we have now an addi additional um, 
barriers or um, factors that impact people when they're trying to have a continuing bond or wanting to have a continuing bond with their deceased loved one. So, for example, the context of the death is, is a, a big stressor here. People have said a lot about this lack of opportunity to say goodbye, lack of opportunity to resolve unfinished business. So these, these are massive um, issues when you're wanting to have a continuing relationship, when that stands between you, so to speak. You know, I haven't been able to do this. And, um, and so that, that's where therapy is a, is a really useful place for people to have an opportunity to actually um, say the things they need to say um, and build that relationship again. Then, of course, restrictions on burial, funeral rites that we, we've observed and we are observing right now um, around the world. It's, um, this is ha also has a massive impact. Um, on how we experience our deceased, you know, have we done, we haven't done the right by them is what people sometimes feel because they haven't been able to follow um, their cultural rituals. Um, that, and that, that feels then like a lack or a gap that may, um, people, may, people may bring into a counseling or therapy room. And of course, social isolation and grief. When we think about grief as people actually coming together, you know, naturally to comfort each other, the word consolation is not used enough. Dennis Klass has re re resurrected it a few years ago in bereavement literature, talking about consolation. You know, we come together in grief. It is a, a human, almost a, a biological, natural move you wanting to bring comfort to each other. And if you can't do this, this is going to be, um, you know, of course, a massive, um, another massive factor here. Um, and so who can you talk to about your deceased loved one if there's no one there? So what we're hoping to do usually in these, um, with these techniques in, in, and uh, when we work with continuing bonds and grief therapy is to help people access that continuing bond and re maybe reconstruct it. Um, and um, that can take many different forms. So potential limitations are there are in traditional grief therapy or just sort of the traditional, when I say traditional, I mean Western traditional grief therapy. It's usually one-to-one. -one. We're usually in an enclosed space, sitting, talking. It's usually the focus is often on the grievous emotions. That's the problem, yeah, your emotions. I'm, I'm exaggerating deliberately. The deceased is absent often. You know, if, um, can we actually bring them into the room in some form? There's a goal of letting go and moving on, as we talked before. This is sort of, obviously, I'm exaggerating slightly here, but it's this is something that uh, could be, um, you know, limiting anything in this, uh, in this, in this frame. There are now more and more therapeutic practices, though, where continuing bonds are seen as part and parcel or as worthy foci or worthy um, goals or help uh, to help people with. So the, I already mentioned the two-track model. Actually, the attachment-informed approach by Phyllis Kosminski is very much about that. Here, the continuing bond is seen as a sort of secure base that you're hopefully constructing with your deceased loved one. Narrative approaches, we're constructing our identity and our relationships through our stories. Meaning reconstruction therapy here, Robert Niemeyer has done a lot in this area where the focus is in, in this therapy on you know, reconstructing that um, event story of the death that I mentioned before that often can be traumatic and reconstructing what he calls the backstory of the relationship um, and uh, how we, um, and there's going to be some techniques I'm going to talk about now in this area. So some techniques, um, these are some introducing left one, correspondence, empty chair, I'm going to talk about these now, EMGR, creative techniques, 
So the first one I want to talk about is really my favorite. It's my absolute number one favorite technique in bereavement counseling and therapy. It's also one that I do when I usually, when I teach about bereavement students or do a workshop or anything, I always um, use this as the practice, uh, as a practical exercise for everyone, because this is such a simple and yet extremely powerful technique that anyone can do and you can take it away you can do it at home you can do it in a support group it doesn't necessarily require a trained um, grief therapist um, to do this yeah. um, and that's another thing I love about it actually so um, it's when so what then we're talking about is we're doing remembering conversations now they're basing this idea on um, Barbara Meyerhoff and Michael White, the originator of narrative therapy. Um, they, and Barbara Meyerhoff, I think, is the one who talked about that we all have sort of a club um, in our lives of the most important people. That's our, and, and some people have their members of our club. You know, if you think about it like this. And the idea is just because someone dies doesn't mean they don't need to be members of this club anymore. So how can they stay members or, be, or become remembered in this club? So this, the, that's where the remembering comes from here. Yeah, and this is a construction. It's, um, it's a way of bringing people back in, a creative process that develops the life narrative of the living through a process of interaction with the dead. So the technique that we use in, sometimes in the group or also in one-to-one, is um, that clients are asked to introduce the disease to the therapist or to the group, if it's a group. Um, and then they're sort of reviewing the character of the relationship and we're looking at um, you know, what stories there are that they want to share. And so it is actually about who is this person? You know, we're not talking now about death, we're not talking about pain and distress, we're actually accessing that person that meant so much to us. So, and these are questions. Usually when I show them to people first, they think, oh, well, okay. And then when you actually do this exercise, you will find it's extremely powerful. So just imagine I've lost someone, um, a lovely aunt, say, called, uh, I'll give her the name Shirley now. Now, someone might ask me, who was Shirley to you? What did knowing Shirley mean to you? Wow, that's a big question, isn't it? What did Shirley mean to me? So here's a name, here's a person. And suddenly this person has characteristics, attributes, um, maybe some funny things she once said that still sticks with me. So are there times, places, or ways in which you recall Shirley's importance to you? Yeah, of course. And then I think about a particular event. I'm bringing it back I'm, uh, and I'm sharing this with the person or with the group who are listening now and are getting to know Shirley. They're not just hearing about Shirley died of a heart attack at the age of da, 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 da. Yeah. They're hearing Shirley as a person, Shirley as someone who is significant, who does things, who has thoughts, ideas, who interacts with us. So she's becoming potentially available for the people in the group to have a relationship with as well. So particular stories come to mind. What kinds of things did she teach you about life? Yeah. So there's something I can learn from her. What might she have appreciated about you? <clears throat> and who, who you are and how, you, how that, that bit, I'm just um, leaving that second part there. This is a central question. This is a central point that we often neglect in our grief therapy approaches. The person who died had a particular perspective on us. Maybe other people don't have that perspective. So let's say Shirley thought I was a really wise person. She saw me as wise. Maybe nobody else in my life thinks I'm a wise person. So when I'm with Shirley, I'm accessing that part of me that's wise person. 
Shirley dies, does that mean I'm no longer a wise person because there's nobody else who makes me feel like that? And that's where we can bring that back. We can bring that part of the identity back. It doesn't need to be lost because we can bring the living presence in, our, in this kind of narrative context back to actually access that, those aspects again that we shared and that are still there. They don't need to die at, as well. So this is an important point that I want to make, put across. If, if anything I want to put across, it's that. So you can see also, you can um, extend this um, with objects, for example, meaningful objects. So we asked in our meaning and loss group, we asked the, the, the participants prior to the session of introducing the loved one to bring an object that is very meaningful with regard to their deceased loved one, to bring that with them. So when they then introduced their loved one, they held the object up, they showed it to us, Everyone could see it. it was a very tangible presence, but it was also imbued with meaning and emotions and rich. And this object was then placed on a table. And this table, the, the participants in the group said they would like to keep that table every session. So we kept the table with those objects every session. And later they were saying it felt to them that like the deceased were actually there as well. And it brings, in any bereavement group, you will find that the deceased are there, but are they actually allowed to be there? Are they invited? Are they welcomed to be there? So that, that's a way of doing it. So we're weaving the deceased into the ongoing lives of the living in this embodied way. So it's a very, it becomes a ritual then for the group to have this table there. Um, <clears throat> So it extends the relationship. There's a network now. So there's, everyone knows the different deceased. They know the relationships. They can talk about them. They can use their names. So they become members again of our membership club. Okay, so a second, um, I'm probably running out of time, but um, I'm going to talk about letter writing as well, because this is one of the key techniques that we use in meaning reconstruction therapy, uh, meaning and loss. Again, it goes back to Michael White, the narrative therapist, um, who started this saying hello again. Um, so again, this is an active way of co connecting with the deceased to write a letter to them. Um, you can access that understanding of the deceased in a new way. Again, you can reestablish your identity as it's shaped by this relationship. You know, you know, if you lose your only child, you are still a mother or a father. Um, and if, as you're actively engaging in a correspondence, you are acting at, in this in this part of, of yourself. From this part, you can address ongoing unfinished business. And rather than letting go and moving on, the person can remain in your lives. So um, this recreates then a relationship. So um, Robert Niemeyer has developed this hello again letter, which has these different prompts that you can use or don't have to use. What I always wanted to tell you and what I now realize, what you never understood was. So this is sometimes um, I, I need to be clear that, of course, you know, the relationships are not all wonderful and um, the, the deceased wasn't all perfect and wonderful, but there are things that may, you know, may have really annoyed you or that um, you never really dare to tell them. So the, again, the letter is, is a great way of, of bringing that out, of being in a real relationship. And then what we ask people to do after that next time is to actually write a response letter from the loved one to themselves. And this can be a very powerful technique. Very often um, the deceased um, gives permission um, because people often, as if you are um, bereaved yourself or if you've worked with bereaved, 
guilt is, is almost always somewhere uh, in the mix. Um, and to, to have that kind of permission to continue life is what often, what can happen. It doesn't have to, you know, can be a very difficult conversation. So I've worked with a client where um, this whole um, correspondence continued on and the letter made her, that she received back from her deceased husband made her angry. And then she wrote another letter and then it came another letter back. And actually we started to have almost like um, a parts work uh, through the letter writing uh, therapy. So there's different questions that we get there. So in talking about parts work, empty chair or, or chair work is something that uh, um, you would have to have training for to, to do that. Um, and also with the letter writing, again, maybe to say, I wouldn't necessarily uh, suggest to do that if you're not trained, um, as it can bring up very painful material or unexpected things. So um, uh, th that I would say you need to have some kind of training or supervision. Um, so empty chair work can be similarly where you can address really difficult aspects of the relationship with the deceased. Um, uh, uh, one, one client I worked with had, um, uh, you know, had did she done the letters, she'd done all sorts of things. But when we did the chair work, that was when there was a breakthrough because um, that father of hers who had seemed so sinister and powerful when she saw him in the chair, she, he sudden, she suddenly saw another part of him, namely a vulnerable part that he had to hide with his aggressive behavior. And, and that helped her actually move beyond um, the relationship she had with him at that point and, and have, have a, a much more, um, yeah, felt a bit relieved and released from that and was able then to connect with some of the parts of him that she um, actually found much more helpful. So working with sense of presence, I'm not going to go into much detail here. Um, so there are questions here like, um, what does it remind you of communications? Maybe what does it mean to you? Um, there's a book chapter on working with welcome and unwelcome presence and grief that I wrote with, together with Jacqueline Hayes, which is also in the Continuing Bonds book from 2018. Um, another um, technique uh, that can be very powerful is visualization. So for example, if you, ask people in a group, say you're doing a support group and you're asking them about sense of presence experiences, I would first do a visualization experience, um, a practice exercise where everyone has a chance of imagining they're meeting the deceased and can have a conversation with them. Because I find that people are often very distressed when they don't have these experiences. So some people have them and some don't, and that can be difficult in a group when those who have them talk about wonderful experiences of spiritual presence and, and the others who desperately want them don't have them. So I would always start with this kind of visualization where everyone can have a bit of a taste of it. And then it, it's different. You can also then bring in the other sense of presence experiences without really making people feel um, worse. Um, um, I wanted to have an example of a, a client, but actually we don't have the time. I just want to mention that she did her letter. She, she, had, she was very distressed about her father, um, that, they, that he was so distant when she was young and he died and she felt there was so much she, she missed out on. And um, when we did this guided imagery, she had this connection with him and, and he told her that he loved her. And strangely, or maybe not strangely, afterwards she found a letter that she had not seen before from him in which he told her he loved her. So that was amazing. And then she wrote another letter, but I'm skipping that. So another way of um, 
I'm saying taking continuing ones to a higher level is this kind of induced after death communication that Alan Botkin developed. And it's actually now become much more accepted um, in, in many different um, mainstream therapy rooms to actually bring this on um, and try actually for people to have these experiences through EMDR. If you are an EMDR therapist, maybe there are some here, you'll know that actually we are in EMDR very open to imagery rescripting, to rescripting the, the nightmares, rescripting traumatic experiences in a much better way. It doesn't change what happened in the past, but it gives you a different feeling for some reason. And if you, if you combine it with that previous experience. So similarly, you can have these experiences of your loved one in a better place, in a safe place, and that can be extremely comforting. For example, in violent death, especially if you've seen um, the person uh, maybe murdered, being murdered, or, you know, these, these terrible images of the body not being whole. And you can, with this kind of technique, allow the person to reconstruct a whole body in their minds to give them that peace, but also to have that kind of connection with them. Um, the dual process model is a very um, uh, common and very uh, uh, predominant model now in, therapy, uh, in, in our understanding of grief. And sometimes continuing bonds work is seen as part of the loss orientation. However, it doesn't need to be. It can also be part of the restoration orientation. So loss is when you're dealing with your loss. And then you, when you're restoring your life, when you're moving on to new things, um, is the restoration orientation. And we sort of oscillate between that and grief. But you can also include continuing bonds on that restoration side. So through legacy work, fundraising, carrying on the deceased's work, engaging in activity. I could say a lot more about this, but I need to cut short. Creative practices um, are um, used a lot, lost boxes, composition work, uh, dreamscaping. I mean, these are just, I'm just throwing these at you now, and I hope you can, if you're interested, look some of these up. Rituals, um, again, these can be developed spontaneously with clients, or as we did in the group, we actually did our ending ritual in this meaning and loss group as um, everyone bringing food that was meaningful in connection with their deceased loved one. And then we shared this. So there was one participant whose partner had died three and a half years ago. And her partner's favorite food was this rice pudding that she cooked. And she had not cooked it all this time. And then for the last session of our group, she cooked the rice pudding. And I mean, I can't speak now. I'm, I'm just welling up just thinking about it. Um, it was so moving how we all ate that rice pudding together and shared with her. And yeah, group work can be very powerful because you're sharing um, in your relationship with the deceased, with others, you're co-constructing meaning. It can develop these rituals and legacy projects. I mean, one thing is groups can also be very difficult, you know, group dynamics and comparisons between people. Um, another supervisor of mine has just finished a study on the meaning and loss group, uh, did uh, qualitative interviews. And uh, so she's brought out, and that will be published, uh, a lot of um, issues, both the good and the bad in there. So it's not all just rosy. And the other thing I also forgot to say earlier is that continuing bonds isn't always necessarily desirable. You know, if you have um, a very abusive relationship um, in the past, it may be that you want to cut that bond. And so we're not saying, you know, you need to continue the bonds with everyone uh, in your past. Um, so I really hope that I didn't come across, I, I get passionate about it, but I don't want to come across as being prescriptive in this. So um, facilitative processes to sum up is remembering loved one, reconstructing the social identity. So sharing stories, for example, uh, is helpful. Creating the symbolic presence, maybe through an object, um, direct communication, letter writing, conversation, dialogue, not just talking to the deceased, but also hearing their messages back 
re-establishing that part of our identity that's connected with them, um, creatively restructuring the relationship, experiential creative and reflective exercises are helpful, and also ritual embodied communal practice. So these are just some books to, that I would like to recommend, especially Remembering Lives by Lorraine Hedzke and John Winslet. I'm sure that I mention it again and again. It's one of my favorites. Um, and it talks, they talk about not just continuing bonds, they talk about end of life and actually preparing for that new relationship quite openly with the person who's dying, if, if that's possible. It's really exciting, that book. Um, Christine Valentine's Bereavement Narratives, and then our recent book, 2018. And here also these techniques of grief therapy, and there's a third one coming soon for meaning-oriented grief therapy from Robert Niemeyer. I, I can really recommend them warmly. And I just want to finish with a little plug. I know I'm running over um, very quickly. This is the Handbook of Grief Therapies. We'll have lots of different therapy approaches in there. And then also looking at grief in different populations. You may recognize some of these names. Um, and another plug coming soon-ish is my Working with Continuing Bonds and ther Grief Therapy book, which includes all those techniques that I've just mentioned and with a chapter each, really. And then also particular questions will be addressed, um, more difficult things um, that, that may not be covered in the different chapters with resources on his further reading. And then this is the end or not, and you can contact me uh, here. So that's it. Thank you. I'm going to stop share.